discussion under the I Meditate Africa series, which focuses on socioeconomic matters facing the African continent in the time of COVID-19. The panel discussion with Gurudev uh, Shri Shri Ravi Shankar is under the theme Africa Innovates, uh, the, to the role of uh, the meditation in driving innovation in education, health and uh, commerce. We're going to take you there to that uh, panel uh, discussion now. Business fail. Leaders are under tremendous pressure. They had to cater to the needs, needs and uh, requirements of their followers, our people whom they are leading. So here, people who uh, follow, whether it is politics or uh, economy, even if it's spiritual, religious. There is tremendous demand on the time of the leader, number one, on the uh, attention span of the leader, aware alertness of the leader and insight of the leader. Leader need to have deep insight and a better understanding of the situation. Now, if we are is obvious to all of us, our perception gets very blurred. We are unable to see things how they are. And moreover, our intuitive ability almost dies. You cannot be intuitive if you are stressed, if you have too much pressure on you. But for a leader of uh, to innovate anything or to guide in any situation or to envision something, you need tremendous inner strength or calmness of mind. Here, meditation provides you that much-needed calmness. It enhances our intuitive ability. It uh, um, gives us courage when we need it the most, you know. Because when you have to take care of responsibility of so many, so many, you need to be well-grounded and not to be impulsive and have a long sight you know, uh, a long vision for the future. All these, uh, you know, can be achieved with a calm and serene state of mind which meditation provides you right away. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Gurudev. Our second panelist is the CEO of KPMG. His name is Mr. Ignatius Sehule, and he's a chartered accountant and he's been challenged with trying to turn KPMG around locally, reputationally. So he will now pose his question. I've been very familiar with KPMG. I've been to the Netherlands office and I've addressed the, uh, the, the international you know, mission of KPMG there. It's a wonderful organization, very reputed. And uh, yeah, they're taking care of many things. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, it, it's really an honor for me. Um, you, you may or may not know that the vision of uh, KPMG is to be the most trusted and trustworthy professional services firm. Um, the question that I have is how do we harness uh, meditation for all professionals at all times, even under difficult circumstances like under this COVID-19 or any other difficult circumstances that professionals find themselves working under, how do we ensure that at the core of their thinking and of their heart, at the center of what preoccupies them, even as they carry out these assignments for clients and for employers, how do we ensure that they keep saving the public interest first before anything else? Yeah, I have a, a suggestion for all chartered accountants, lawyers, judges, and all those who have to, uh, to, have to work with numbers the whole day, or logic the whole day. You know, I would recommend them to listen to music as a ritual almost every day. See, because our brain is such that the left brain is logic and the right brain is music. So... When you are giving so much load on your left brain by the numbers, by 
all your mathematical calculations and logic the other part of the brain remains starved so we need to provide for that side of the brain as well so i would always recommend uh, uh, that lawyers uh, judges and chartered accountants uh, to listen to music preferably instrumental music in which uh, you know words are not there you are not catching on to the words or getting back to the meanings of it but just uh, listen to the instrumental music this would definitely make one feel more energetic and less drained see it's very draining you know the work is so draining and if you are drained then naturally your emotions are topsy turvy so uh, music is one thing i would also recommend them to do breathing exercises breathing exercise uh, will take us a long way into having a very healthy and uh, uh, calm centered mindset in all these uh, testing times that we are undergoing trying t- trying times that we are in today we need inner strength i would say the mental strength is very very essential you know if you have to be in the closed door and people are getting depressed feel lonely feel sort of agitated then that will definitely reflect in their job as well so the job or whatever they are doing their profession cannot be uh, of high quality or very good Um, or to their own satisfaction if they are mentally not uh, calm so here again i would say few minutes of breathing technique will help music will help and meditation definitely will give them tremendous strength see all day we work by the end of the day by by the time sunset uh, or by evening you are exhausted but if you take that little time 20 minutes and meditate in the evening you will find yourself so much more cheerful uh, till you go to bed you know you feel very fresh and energetic meditation is good but to be uh, i mean to be practiced either at noon time or in the, even in the evening it will really really make a difference Thank you Gurudev and the next panelist is Professor Adam Habib the Vice Chancellor of the University of the Witwatersrand known as WITS he is a active political scientist who is very passionate about education and social justice so professor habib well thank you for having me and it's really an honor uh, interacting with you Uh, my question is that in a world that is moving online as we are now uh how do we ensure that we do this in a way that doesn't disadvantage the poor how do we mitigate against deepening inequality so that online doesn't simply happen for the rich and that the poor are excluded because if the poor are excluded then we as a human community cannot come together and if we as a human community cannot come together we cannot address the collective challenges of our time including this pandemic that we currently confront uh yes professor habib i uh, do agree with what you are saying i mean this is a big concern for all of us today in the world you know our youth our young people are either moving towards aggression on one side or to depression neither of this is going to help us people who are depressed they don't care for others they don't care for themselves even so there is no question of caring for others on the other hand people who are aggressive they also have uh, no care no concern no compassion for anybody else and sometimes people who are aggressive they harm themselves even more than they would harm others so these two extremities that the society is facing today is because of stress 
I would point out the stress as the main culprit to in pushing our young generation in these two extreme uh, state of mind, which has caused so much suffering in the whole world. So we need to get people out of uh, aggression and depression in order for them to uh, be a normal, hu- compassionate human being. A human being which is sensitive and sensible. Someone who is sensitive and who is sensible um, is possible only when they are free from stress. So I would say that um, again here meditation will help them great deal. And I have seen this happening even in South African prisons. We have done quite a bit of work where, uh, you know, all those very aggressive people uh, later on got rehabilitated and they started doing social service with all their heart. I mean, people couldn't believe this is the same people who are always coming to rob them are now giving a helping hand to the same people to uplift their spirit. I think not a single human being is born into this planet as a bad guy or a person without compassion. No. Everyone is born as a wonderful, beautiful young child. But uh, due course of life, somewhere uh, we miss and we get stressed out and then uh, our people end up as the so-called bad guys in my uh, in my uh, you know view i don't see there is any bad person on the planet they're only either sick mentally emotionally spiritually or they are ignorant in either case we need to help them out thank you gurudev next is professor paddy upton is the head coach in professional t20 cricket is a mental coach to professional athletes and the professor of practice at Deakin University. Professor Upton. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, Guruji. Uh, the last time we met in person, I think it was 2011, I visited you with some of the Indian cricketers and lovely to see you, even though it's um, across a, a um, computer screen here. My question for you, um, when we look back at this period of COVID-19 from some point in the future, we will notice that some leaders have led their their people successfully through these difficult times and some leaders would have not. And I'd be interested to hear from you what you see as one or two of the key things that successful leaders of organizations and countries would have done well. I would say um, someone Someone who is committed to your work, who just want um, progress in whatever field they are coaching or leading. Uh, When they put their heart and soul, and I think that is success. The success in the very attitude and the action itself rather than the end result. You know, suppose you have 10 students who come to you and you put your 100% and not all the 10 would uh, go to get the first rank. It's impossible. But every inch they have made um, a move, I think uh, we should consider that as a success. Thank you. Thank you, Gurudev. Uh, Then there's Dr. Kumi Naidu. He's the former head of the Amnesty International and the Greenpeace. He's the first African head of Greenpeace. Dr. Kumi Naidu. Thank you very much. Mm. Well, I start by saying that I just finished yesterday a crash course in the happiness program with the breathing and meditation organized by my wonderful friends in Art of Living South Africa. I am very grateful to have had the chance to do it. And ironically, it's a coronavirus that enabled me to do it because it forced me to stop and on. And even though I only did it at 55, 
I want to believe it's better late than never, and I encourage all my fellow panelists to consider doing it if they haven't. I put it to you, Gurudev, that while the world is focused on coronavirus right now as the big global pandemic, that in fact the worst disease that humanity faces is not coronavirus, not influenza, but it's a disease we can call affluenza, which is a pathological illness where humanity has been led to believe that a good, meaning, decent life comes from more and more and more material acquisitions. In fact, the coronavirus has shown that the poor actually subsidize the overconsumption of the rich. So while we are all desperate to go back to normal, including myself, and I'm sure you as well, we have to ask ourselves, do we want to go back to a normal that is about unsustainability, it's about inequality, it's about injustice, it's about the oppression of women, it's about not treating prisoners like human beings and so many other issues. So my question to you is, what is your definition of the kind of normal that we should be going to? And can meditation help us solve one of the worst diseases, the worst disease that humanity faces, that of affluenza, overconsumption, unsustainability, inequality? Thank you very much. You know, when we are not sensitive towards the need of others, and we have, we don't um, listen to the, the nature and we have no long sight, I mean far sight into the future of the, uh, of the world. If we are uh, short sighted in our plans and you know, um, uh, plans and programs, then uh, uh, the planet is not in safe hands. People should wake up and see that we, uh, our programs, our plans must be sustainable. We must care for environment. But one thing I would like to tell you, tell Mr. Naidu that uh, 20 years back, nobody even spoke about it. When we were raising voice, when people like you and Greenpeace and us, Art of Living, we were so concerned about environment. But you know, luckily today, all the governments around the world are talking about environment. Those days, if you talk, I'm talking about 30 years back, 40 years back, when we spoke about, you know, to be sustainable in environment, to save rivers, to save trees, to say, to, to be concerned about the um, weather and, you know, about global warming. And people would like just look, us, uh, look at us as though you're talking from some other planet. You know, you must remember that. I think in those days, uh, nobody cared for environment. People were just going left, right, center and doing mining and they were cutting trees. And they thought um, these are some sort of outdated thinking of trying to protect the environment. But luckily I'm happy that today there is a lot of awareness about it. We kept on and on and on. We ourselves, in Art of Living, planted 85 million trees around the world. We have saved about 40, uh, 43 rivers which were dying, which were just on the map only. There were not really no river on the ground. So when we keep doing what we think is the right thing for, for, the, for the needs, for the creation, I'm sure, you know, people will follow that. Coming to this uh, consumerism, I would like to tell you the younger generation have a fad these days of living with minimal things. Young people between 18 and 25 and 27, I see them all around the world, they are not thinking about big cars or having two cars or three cars, no. Their interest is something very different. They want to have a happy life. They're looking for happiness. They want. They just enjoy having small little jokes here and there. You know, they create many 
uh, fun things. So I hope the coming generation, I'm sure it will, they will, uh, they will not be so greedy and uh, they will not destroy the planet Earth. I'm sure they will, they'll be very sensitive and they're much more sensible because they saw people of the previous generation, in spite of having all affluence, they were not happy. So they were lonely, <laughs> they were desperate, they were angry, they were upset. And, uh, you know, kids catch them very, um, they're very smart, they catch it. And they say, we don't want to live like that. So that is one, um, uh, it's a ray of hope for the coming generation. At the same time, there is a lot of poverty on the other side, which we we need to be with. You know, there is empathy is needed there. We we need to give that helping hand to people. There's a lot of poverty and lack of education. I was telling, you know, we need to make uh, our Asian and African continent 100% educated in the coming uh, decades. If we take this as our challenge, we simply go on educating our youth Educating in human values. It is very important. Then the conflicts can be done away with. That would help us a great deal. What do you think? I agree all of with what you said. I do think, however... Thank you, Gurudev. Uh, in the interest of time, we've got four more panelists. So okay. if I can please ask uh, number six to begin. It's Ms. Juliet, the Director of Education and Social Services at Kampala. So she's in charge of education within Kampala. Uh, yes. Juliet. Yes. Thank you very much. It's an honor for me to be a part of this panel. And I would like to say that COVID-19 has led to many parents staying at home and bonding with their children more. All over the world, I must say, the children have acquired many values and skills other than the formal education that they always have. And this would usually not happen in the normal situation because the parents would be out looking for money to look and support their families. So my question to you, Guru Dev, is that what advice would you give to parents to balance their time better in order not to fail to carry out their parenting role? It's a very valid question. Uh, you know, even after this lockdown is over, I would recommend that we should have one week of well-planned lockdown every year so that, so that uh, you know, the family bonding happens much stronger. Uh, yes. Gets, uh, gets a breathing space. The environment can breathe, you know, nature can rejuvenate itself. Mm -hmm. uh, having said this, I think this has uh, rekindled that trend which we had in the past, that families would sit together at least on weekends or on different times every day. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, I would uh, say the parents should continue at least sharing a meal or two every day with the whole family and spend mm -hmm. some time with the kids. You know, it's usually kids spend with their pals and family, uh, the parents spend time with their own thing. I think they should balance between uh, work and life. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Gurudev. The next panelist is Dr. Adriana Murray, and uh, she's the founder of Proudly Human. Adriana. Thank you. It's such an honor to be here. And I should say such a great pleasure to see you again uh, on the screen, Gurudev. We had the fantastic, for me, opportunity to meet a couple of years back at the Art of Living Ashram in Bangalore. And we, yeah, exchanged, yeah, <laughs> we exchanged a few words on, on my, my dream of exploring worlds beyond our own planets and my vision of becoming one of the first humans to live on the planet Mars. So my question could have been around what, uh, in your opinion, would be 
the most fundamental and important principles on which we could establish a new society if we had this opportunity to start from scratch. But many people enjoy that question. It can be fun for them because it's a, an imaginary exercise. So let me make the question even more difficult. Um, I think we have the opportunity now in this lockdown, the circuit breaker, the this, this stop of activity on Earth, to really reflect on, on how far we've come as humans, but how far we still have to go. So my more difficult, perhaps, question for, for you, um, in your opinion, what are the fundamental principles on which our society on Earth should be based? And even more importantly, how can we reflect in this time on what steps we should take towards achieving this utopia, not on an imaginary, not so imaginary for me, a uh, place such as Mars, but right here on Earth? What, what steps can we take? Thank you, David. Well, first of all, we need to teach our, ourselves how we can handle our, our own mind, our own emotions. If our emotions are flying haywire and our thoughts are not in our control, then we don't know what we are doing, right? So we need an education about ourselves. Yeah. See, when you get a car, first you learn, you have a manual that comes with it. Then you know what is where, right? You get in any technology, uh, any instrument, new instrument, a manual goes with it. But for life, we come with no manual. We don't know how to operate ourselves, our emotions, our ego, our intellect, our memory. So first and foremost, we need in our education system, good behavior. Good behavior is the behavior which you don't want others Towards you, you should not do towards others. That's a baseline. If you are if you are in business, you don't do something to your customer. What you don't do, you don't expect your vendors to do to you. This baseline that we must really touch upon, uh, basic ethics in life, um, and compassion. If human beings are robbed of their compassion, they cease to be human beings. But we do very little to nurture this uh, fragrance that nature has kept in us. So I would say we need to give all this and then we need to educate ourselves on how to take challenges. Life will not be all smooth. There, there are thorny bushes around and there will be dark days that, my, that we may have to face, but we must equip ourselves. So, the strength to, um, you know, go through tough time is something that, uh, that also can come through education. Yeah. Thank you, Gurudev. There's two more panelists. The next one is Mr. Manar Muni, who's a businessman from Botswana. And he was instrumental in starting Art of Living in Botswana in 1996. Yes, yes, Manohar Ji, how are you? Hey, Gurudev, hey, Gurudev. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. I think at 82, I still have lots of energy. And I know that it comes from the inspiration that you gave us some 24, 25 years ago in Botswana. Uh, it's been a long time, Guruji, and I've been at the ashram on two occasions, but both occasions you were traveling. However, I did spend quality time with uh, Bharat Bhai and uh, Hemaji. Uh, Guruji, just to fly the Botswana flag, if you don't mind, uh, we were not only pioneers in starting out of living in Botswana, but we started it in Africa. And it's from Botswana that it went to the rest of Africa just to fly the little flag for Botswana. No, I know, I know. Guruji, uh, my question. COVID-19 seems to have brought about an awakening that together with uh, economic growth, we also need moral and spiritual growth. What then is the role of meditation in politics and business? Also, it seems that a crisis can bring about the best or the worst in people. What can we do to bring about only the best? 
Well, this Rishi. very question, if everyone start asking what is that we can do to make the world a better place, what is that we can do? See, after this lockdown, after Corona-19, the world will not be same. There is a lot of changes both in mindset and in the working style. Already people have started working in, uh, working uh, through internet, you know, work at home. And the coming future, I mean, even education, institutions, educational institutions may also all have to go online. So we'll be doing many things online, of course. But at the same time, a lot of precautions need to be taken. Because this has uh, in somewhat shaken uh, people's faith in interaction with others on a physical uh, proximity. You know, the people will be, still be afraid to go in, um, in gatherings in, uh, or even games. People go and play games and... Uh, there would be concern. There will be a lot of concern in this. Uh, and it will, it will continue for some more time. But I would say post-corona, more compassion in workplace is what we can expect. There will be more compassion, more togetherness, and the world as one unit will start uh, moving towards the next level of economic growth. So this situation will be taken as a diving board for a better economy around the world. Thank you, Gurudev. Gurudev, we have our last panelist. It's Professor Salim Karim, and he's leading the COVID research in the country and he's advisor to the president and he's renowned for his research in HIV as well. So we all look to him for when we end the lockdown. Over to Professor Karim. Yes, Mr. Salim. You have to unmute. You are on mute. Hello? You are on mute, Professor Karim. Okay. No. I'm unmuted. No, yeah, no one can hear. Ah, good. Now we can well, thank you that. very much, Guruji. It's an honor and a great pleasure. Um, I uh, have interacted with many of the people who follow you, and I hold you in incredibly high regard. As we think about the situation we find ourselves in, a situation where virus that we cannot even see with the naked eye, has infected over 4 million people. We have hundreds of thousands of deaths. And what this virus has done, it has taken away from us the very thing that defines an important part of our humanity, the way in which we interact with fellow human beings, the way in which we establish our emotional bonds, the way in which we relate to family, friends, colleagues, all of that is being redefined. As we think about this being a long-term problem, I do not anticipate we're gonna have a vaccine within the next 12 to 18 months. We're gonna to have to learn to live with this new normal. I'd like to ask you, how can we, as a, as a human species, rediscover our humanity, find a way to still thrive as a nation, as a world, and as a people, despite this virus robbing us of one of our best strengths? <sighs> Yes, yes, Professor Kari, but a very, very valid question. Uh, what can we do? Okay, we find vaccine for this. What if another virus appears in an, down the line, another four, five years later, you may come up with similar virus, one more, you know? So uh, we cannot reel your all the time, number one. 
Second is, you know, when people think about uh, the virus, uh, they think about, oh, this is the end of life. That means when there is no medicine for it, that means this is it. This is where they need the proper guidance and education. The mortality rate of this is only 3%, 3 percent, 3.5% or so. Not everybody dies because of the virus. We all live with many microbes, many viruses in our lives. Well, this is a newly discovered one which spreads very fast. And you know, I think our immune system is so strong, um, our uh, genes are so strong, so we, our body will get uh, its own self-defense system much stronger to face such things. So we, here again, we need to improve our immune system. That is most important. Because there are many type of influenzas that come, uh, many type of, you know, uh, viruses that people have been experiencing. Uh, and so we need not be paranoid about this. Yes, we want to be very careful so that it doesn't spread and we are taking all precautions at the same time, uh, we must see that the population is not pushed to the, to the brim of paranoia where we, we have a huge mental health problem. Now already a big chunk of our population is suffering from, um, has started <laughs> this obsessive compulsive disorder. They go on washing their hands. In the beginning days, in the television, they saw you have to wash your hands so many times. Now, this obsession has taken over. And many those who do not even have any contact of virus, mentally they start feeling there is something wrong in them. You know, in the hospitals, doctor had to stop, tell them, don't come to test unless you have serious symptoms. Because our mind plays a huge... Uh, role here in, in keeping our immune system strong and fighting the, uh, the epidemic. Otherwise, if the mind is weak, we very easily succumb to it. Of course, there are many research work is uh, happening, uh, even in Ayurveda, some research work is happening in how whether through herbs we can combat this. I remember uh, when we had the issue of uh, tuberculosis in the world when there was no medicine for tuberculosis, when people were quarantined for that. There was such a paranoia. Today, you know, that has subsided. That is not there anymore. So maybe Ebola and many other, uh, you know, swine flu, all these came as a big wave and they disappeared, but humanity marched ahead. I think this will happen with this one also. Thank but, you so much, Gurudev. But I, I wish you all success in your research work and please continue and see if we can do anything. And we have some Ayurvedic uh, uh, thing also if uh, in South Africa, if the institute and university would like to do research on this. Um, we would be more than happy to share some protocol and see what we can do together. Lovely. So wonderful, Guruji. And on behalf of Africa, we'd like to thank you for spending so much time. You gave us more time than we were allocated. We're very, very, very grateful for that. So thank you so thank much, you. Gurudev. Now the world is waiting with us for meditation. They're already waiting few minutes, we'll now start the meditation, yeah? Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, that's the I Meditate Africa series uh, that uh, we brought for you, uh, that conversation on the role of meditation in driving innovation in education, health and uh, commerce uh, during this time as uh, we're dealing with a pandemic. Uh, of course, uh, Gurudev Sri Sri Shankar, uh, taking some uh, questions there from some uh, familiar faces. Uh, he's a humanitarian and uh, spiritual leader and also founded uh, the Art of Living Foundation in 1981, talking about methods on how to raise energy.
energy levels and of course that's much uh, needed at uh, this time uh, during uh, lockdown and all that uh, is new that uh, we're experiencing at this time those familiar uh, faces and of course the names that uh, were part of that uh, panel we heard from uh, professor adam habib uh, vice chancellor at uh, wits uh, of course asking how uh, do we stop ourselves from excluding the poor when we're doing all of this these things uh, online uh, we also heard from kumi naidu former head of uh, amnesty international and uh, professor karim who of course uh, clinical uh, clinical infectious diseases um, epidemiologist and of course as we know he has been advising uh, the health department at this time uh, while we have been dealing with uh, the coronavirus so those are some of uh, the issues that were spoken about one of the main questions that i think uh, the who also kind of raised at some point was you know how we stop people from uh, being the worst of themselves at this point um, i heard uh, professor i think karim saying you know what uh, no it was in fact uh, kumi naidu asking uh, you know how do we bring the best out of people because during a pandemic of course you know it sort of brings out the best and the worst of uh, people and how do we uh, get the best uh, uh, out of uh, people so quite an interesting one there and a different take on really how to deal with uh, covid-19 all right let's take a short break do stay with us uh, sa today continues after this